now it's my great privilege to introduce to you uh, Mr. Michael Barone. Um, Michael Brown uh, graduated from the Cranbrook Schools in, in Michigan, a uh, bachelor's degree at Harvard, uh, a law degree at Yale. He's the, um, one of the principal uh, political reporters at uh, US News and World Report. He's also the principal author of the Almanac of American Politics, a very important uh, reference book, an encyclopedia that's produced every two years about uh, American politics at every level. His, uh, and, uh, his knowledge of, of that is encyclopedic. And what's, I think, fascinating about his lecture today, which is going to be not about uh, the last two years, but about the uh, 17th century, is that he applies many of the same techniques, the same sort of approach to sifting through the empirical data to the events of that period that he applies to modern, modern American politics. And uh, I think we'll see, too, uh, how important those events, those, those years in the 1680s, are to our own institutions, our own way of life uh, today. Uh, just mentioned a few of his books, uh, Our Country, The Shaping of America from Roosevelt to Reagan, The New Americans, How the Melting Pot Can Work Again, Hard America, Soft America, Competition versus Coddling and the Battle for the Nation's Future in 2004, and then most recently, which is the subject of tonight's lecture, Our First Revolution, The Remarkable British Uprising that Inspired America's Founding Fathers. So Mr. Brown's going to talk to us tonight about our first revolution and beyond. Mr. Brown, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you very much. It's, uh, it's nice to be here at uh, University of Texas since you're initiating a program of Western Civilization and American Institutions. Uh, and in, in, uh, here in election season. Um, I sometimes get up these days and uh, say that I know people want to talk about the elections and I'm prepared to talk at length about the Italian elections that are going to be held April 13th and 14th, which you've probably been reading a lot about. Uh, and then there's the election for mayor of London between Red Ken Livingston and Boris Johnson uh, on May 1st, uh, which is an important election. But we've also, uh, here in Texas, people are voting more or less as we speak, early voting. A couple blocks away at Doby Hall, uh, speaking just uh, right now or recent times, is Michelle Obama. Uh, this audience, uh, I'm afraid, has all made a decision uh, to forego seeing Hillary Rodham Clinton at her uh, rally at the convention center, which is going on as we speak. Uh, it's interesting to me that the campaigns have assigned women uh, to Austin, Texas, the capital of the state that elected as its governors, uh, Ann Richards and Ma Ferguson. Uh, I, I see people of the vintage of Ann Richards perhaps in the audience, but I don't think there are any Ma Ferguson uh, <laughs> veterans here. Um, the, uh, the, we, we can talk, I suppose, in the question and answer period a little about uh, what's going on in Texas. Uh, Texas does have, uh, you know, if you look at the polling data, uh, the Texas Democratic contest could very well determine all uh, by itself uh, who's the Democratic nominee for president this year. Um, this is, uh, we've certainly had a wild time these last 60 days. It's been just 60 days since the Iowans. Uh, gathered for their Republican and Democratic caucuses, which were held for gosh knows what good reason on uh, January 3rd on the, uh, what this, the, um, the ninth day of Christmas um, on a cold Tuesday night. We, we still have 246 days until we get a chance to vote in November. And we take all this for granted, I think. Uh, I mean, it's, uh, this political communication is going around in the air. Uh, uh, instant messages are going around sometimes to the eventual regret of the politicians who are may sending them. Uh, people are voting early, have been early voting here in Texas for a couple of weeks. We've got these political meetings and we grumble about the defects and quirks of our two parties presidential delegate selection systems which are certainly uh, far from perfect. Uh, we groan about the state of the nation and yet I think if we apply any historic perspective uh, to where we are today. Uh, we have so very much to be grateful for. Uh, this country is the most free and prosperous, creative, militarily strong nation in the history of the world. Uh, and the world in this decade, of the 2000s or aught-aughts or whatever you want to call it, uh, we are living at a time of the greatest economic, world economic growth in history. There has been nothing like it ever. Uh, we're seeing uh, more people move out of poverty, however you want to define it, uh, by the millions every year. Uh, this presents some challenges to us, but at the same time, uh, this is a tremendous achievement going on. Uh, 
most of us here uh, were alive and aware uh, to see the demise of the evil empire of the Soviet communism, uh, though some of the students may be too young to have appreciated at the time. Uh, many of us were alive and some of us aware at the destruction of German Nazism, all of which, of course, the United States played a great part. And, and we owe to others, I think, all these great things. Representative government, guaranteed liberties, global capitalism, and anti-tyrannical foreign policy. Um, and it was in thinking about these things and asking the questions, um, to whom do we owe uh, these great things? How did they get their start uh, in, the, in the American, in America, in the Anglo-American world uh, that prompted me to write this book, Our First Revolution? Uh, we're pretty familiar these days with our founding fathers, with George Washington and the other great founders, with Abraham Lincoln, with the people who made and preserved the nation. Uh, and even if universities in recent times have not been willing to teach their stories uh, and have not been willing to, to, to uh, inform students about them, we've seen that adult readers uh, have been very interested indeed in reading about this. We've had some first class uh, popular histories written both by academic historians and by non-academic historians about uh, uh, of, of very high quality, about George Washington, about Benjamin Franklin, about Alexander Hamilton, Thomas Jefferson, John Adams, uh, you know, David McCullough sold 2.7 million copies of a book about John Adams. Uh, that's, uh, you know, McCullough is a good brand name. But this, that, you know, the fact is that at least half those people actually read that book. And there's going to be a TV series about it. And uh, people are interested. They're asking this question, where does this great system that we have, however flawed it may be in some respects, however discontent we've, we are in some, in others, where did this come from? Uh, where, to whom do we owe these great things? Um, what accidents of history, what good luck and happy circumstances are responsible for them as well? Uh, and to, that prompted me uh, to write uh, this book, uh, Our First Revolution, about uh, events that are generally referred to as the Glorious Revolution of 1688-89. Uh, and I found as I was writing it that when I uh, mentioned, you know, what I was working on to friends and relatives, Almost all people who are well-educated, well-read, uh, you know, knowledgeable people, most of them didn't know what I was talking about. A few said, well, was that Cromwell and the Civil War or something, which was the right century. They're zeroing in on it. Uh, but it's something that's just not taught and is not read about. Uh, and yet, I think uh, it's, it's a series of events that were very important that turned out to have uh, hugely important consequences that are reverberating today. And at the same time, it's an exciting story because it's an unlikely enterprise that succeeded. Uh, you know, we read pieces in the uh, uh, journals and newspapers today about why this campaign failed or why this government program failed. Um, in human affairs, lots of enterprises fail. Uh, what's really fascinating is that some of them do succeed and against considerable odds. And this is one of these stories, uh, a story about uh, the men and women to whom we owe many of these good things. Um, and it's interesting, it actually does include women as an important uh, part of it. I know academically, politically correct, you've always got to include women in the story, even if they actually didn't play much of a role. Uh, in this case, since you're writing about royals and nobility, the women actually do play uh, an important role uh, because of uh, who they were and what they did. Uh, and these were things that happened, of course, uh, primarily in England, uh, but also uh, in Scotland, uh, Ireland, uh, and the Netherlands. Uh, we, we owe, uh, I think, more of our institutions than we generally recognize to the example uh, uh, in, in, the, uh, in the practice uh, of the Netherlands of the Dutch Republic of the 17th century. Uh, these men and women were not trying to consciously create the society we know today. Uh, their purposes were more limited than that. They acted out of self-concern as well as idealism, out of calculation as well as conviction. Uh, they were uh, trying to create uh, a future which they couldn't fully envisage themselves. Uh, and they were operating in times when uh, you had, uh, uh, on, on the basis of, of highly imperfect information, 
I mean, one of the fascinating things about writing about the 17th century is that, you know, we take for granted more or less instant communication. And even if you're writing about the period of the Civil War, they had the telegraph and you have the picture of Lincoln walking over from the White House to the Secretary of War's office to get the latest telegrams, uh, much as we sit at our computers and uh, look at the latest things and so forth. Uh, in the 17th century, it wasn't like that. Uh, news moved very much more slowly, and you have the additional complication that England had a different calendar than uh, the continental Europe, so they were 10 days uh, apart. Uh, one of the little challenges of writing a narrative in this thing is not getting the dates wrong, making tables so that you actually don't have things happening in the wrong order. And uh, it's further complicated by the fact that the different uh, states that made up the United Provinces of the Netherlands, some of them had different calendars next to each other. So 20 miles away, they were operating on a different calendar. Um, but this, simply put, uh, the Glorious Revolution of 1688-89, a term which, of course, was applied by people who approved of the developments, uh, was the ouster of King James II and the installation of King William III and King Mary II. Um, in one sense, it's a rather dramatic family story. Mary was James's daughter, uh, and Williams was not only his son-in-law, but also his nephew. Uh, as late as September 1688, James is addressing letters to William, my dear son, spelled S-O-N-N-E in the 17th century way. Um, uh, but it was more than the substitution of one monarch for another, or for two others. Uh, it was really a reconstitution, a restructuring of English government. Uh, the beginning of English high finance and a reorientation of English foreign policy. Uh, and not just English, it had ramifications in Scotland, Ireland, and in England's North American colonies, uh, where each of them had their own sort of revolutions uh, that were prompted by this. Uh, and the reverberations are still with us today uh, in the United States of America. Um, this was a series of events that had uh, much of their origins in uh, different views on religion. Um, uh, some, you know, more recent historians, Marxist historians, sometimes write about this period and they say, well, these people used this religious doctrine because they wanted to advance this species of property interest over against some other interest. And uh, this was a cover uh, story for what they were going about. Uh, I, I'm convinced from my reading that these people were uh, primarily, some of them were cynics, but most of them were motivated by genuous, re genuine religious conviction. And of course, the 17th century was a century of religious conflict throughout uh, Western Europe, uh, conflict between uh, Catholicism, the, the resurgent Catholicism of the Counter-Reformation period uh, against the Protestantism. And it was a period, um, you know, before I started uh, studying and reading about this period, my assumption was that, you know, Protestantism gets its start with Martin Luther, Henry VIII, John Calvin, and it just spreads and, and is successful over most of Europe, and Catholicism is sort of in retreat. That isn't how it looked, things looked in the 1680s. Uh, the Counter-Reformation Church, the church that comes out of the Council of Trent, which uh, concluded its uh, proceedings in 1563, is a resurgent church. It's a church that emphasizes uh, strict belief. It emphasizes also Baroque architecture, incense, beautiful art. Some of the great art in the history of Western man is inspired by the Counter-Reformation Church. Um, and it was a church on the march. Uh, it was a church that, uh, that took over territories or took over rulers who then took over, imposed their religion on the church. So it had taken most of Germany back from Protestantism. It had totally extirpated Protestantism in, uh, in, in uh, uh, Poland, was on its way to doing so in France, uh, in Bohemia, the current Czech Republic. Uh, Protestants just had really a fringe of Europe at this time. Uh, England and Scotland in their different ways. Uh, the United Provinces of the Netherlands, just two million people. England, just five million people on an island there. Um, the Scandinavian countries, some of the North German states, uh, but the big states, France, with 20 million people, was primarily uh, Catholic, and its king, Louis XIV, was bent on uh, getting rid of the Protestants. He revoked an edict of tolerance in 1685, drove the Protestants away from their livings, and in fact, they, uh, many of them streamed um, to places of refuge in Amsterdam, 
London and, interestingly enough, Berlin. Uh, uh, the, uh, the Margrave of Brandenburg um, was the Protestant ruler there and, uh, uh, and became, uh, you know, successful in various mercantile ways. I mean, the Huguenots have given us people like the Rockefellers were Huguenots, for example. Um, the, uh, uh, so this was a period in which the English, most of them, seem to have been convinced uh, that Catholicism was not just a different religion that had beliefs that they didn't agree with, but that it was a threat to their basic freedoms. They were afraid from the 16th century, from the time of Queen Elizabeth, when she was facing Philip II of Spain and Spanish Armada, um, into the uh, 17th century when England was facing Louis XIV, this great expansionist power uh, in France with all of its military might, all of its wealth, all of its million, 20 million people. Uh, and they were afraid that the uh, Catholic Church uh, would, tramp, would trample on their freedoms, would come over, would force them uh, to be a different religion, would take away their protections of law uh, and the rule of law that they enjoyed at that time. Um, and that was uh, the background uh, of England. They had had a, uh, a civil war over religious principles between different Protestants in the 1640s. The king was executed in 1649, King Charles I. You had rule in the 1650s by a government led by a very brilliant General Oliver Cromwell, which was a Republican, small r government, uh, which was uh, maintained largely by a very large standing army that supported various kinds of extreme Protestant religions. They threw out the bishops of the Church of England and the House of Lords. Then King Charles II, Cromwell died. Nobody else could keep things together. Charles II, the young king, was restored after a dozen years of exile in 1660. Um, and that's uh, when we come upon the scene uh, of this book, uh, when the, the events that prompt what I called our first revolution. And it was prompted by the fact that James, the Duke of York, and heir to his brother Charles II, decided to become a Catholic. Charles II, in fact, had many children, at least 15 illegitimate children whom he acknowledged. He had no legitimate children. Uh, he was called the Merry Monarch. Uh, and uh, he was uh, uh, a man of great interest. He founded the Royal Society, Scientific Society, and so forth. He, um, he opined when he was welcomed back to England by giant throngs that he would have come back to the country earlier if he'd known how many people wanted him back. Um, and he, uh, he held public policies which he indicated he did not want to go on his travels again. Uh, and he certainly did not want to be beheaded. Um, the Duke of York was a rather different man. James Duke of York was uh, a more stubborn man, uh, a man of some considerable skill and purpose and bravery in battle. Uh, as Lord High Admiral in 1664, uh, he caused, he did not let the fact that England was not at war with the Dutch Republic prevent him from sending out a fleet to capture New Amsterdam, which it did. And it was renamed for him, New York. Uh, so. Uh, if you, it's a good bar bet question if you ever want to ask, who, who was New York named after? Uh, James, Duke of York, later King James II. Uh, but sometime uh, in the 1660s, he decided to become a Catholic. His brother was exasperated and told him not to tell anybody uh, and uh, don't, do, uh, don't get involved in this. Uh, but in, September, in, in, in April uh, 1673 at Easter at Whitehall Palace, uh, James attended religious services in the King's Chambers, which were separate from the Queen's Chambers, which were also separate from the Duchess of Portsmouth's Chambers, which was another of his mistresses, and the Duchess of Cleveland's Chambers, which was another mistress. Uh, there were about a thousand rooms there, so they had quite a lot of space. But the, uh, at that uh, Easter communion service, James declined to take communion in the Church of England. Uh, and this was a fact of terrific significance. The diarist John Evelyn, uh, great scientific experimenter reports on it, and I quote him uh, in his, uh, his diary entry on this. They were all amazed and thought that this would have great consequences. Uh, the Parliament had just passed a second Test Act. The Test Act required that all people holding public office must be members of the Church of England and must swear an oath to do that. Um, and I gather, you know, in the 17th century, people were very serious about taking oaths. Uh, they, they really believed that if they falsely swore an oath, uh, they would be sent to hell. 
that they would be damned. And that, uh, so this was a very serious thing. Uh, the Test Act Oath required the English to say that they believed in the doctrines of the Church of England, and specifically that they did not believe in transubstantiation, the Catholic doctrine that the communion is the actual eating of the blood and body of Christ. Uh, so uh, James declined to take that oath. He lost his job as uh, Lord High Admiral. Um, <clears throat> and uh, you had uh, a period uh, where there was great political controversy. Uh, you had that in a, in a situation, in a polity, in a nation, a country, um, that had, where the, the government was not all powerful. Uh, there were independent courts and a tradition of common law which had been built up on a case-by-case -case period basis over many years. Um, there was a Church of England which while it, its head was the king uh, also had a certain amount of independence in its bishops uh, and in its ministers. Uh, local government was largely staffed by local notables, uh, by large landowners who were basically independent of the king, who had their own livings, their own property. Uh, and property, of course, was very considered to be a impor very important right to hold your property and to hold it by rule of law. Uh, and the English for many hundred years, hundreds of years, in fact, many of the uh, English uh, common law decisions are about property law and who owns which piece of land and under what con terms and conditions and so forth. They involved this very serious thing. Cromwell's standing army had been dissolved. Uh, law and order was maintained by the militia, which was the body of, uh, of basically uh, free men um, who were, could be summoned to arms and who were expected to provide their own arms uh, in the service of the government uh, against mayhem or rebellion or invasion. Um, and so uh, the general trend in Europe seemed to be in the other direction, particularly as personified by King Louis XIV of France. There, uh, the movement was towards absolutism. And it was considered by many to be the wave of the future. Get rid of these local parliaments, the estates general, don't have the meat anymore. Get rid of the formalities of, uh, of local law and tradition uh, and have everything administered by one uh, purportedly efficient bureaucracy uh, which was uh, operated by the king. Eliminate the local power of local landholders by bringing them all together at the court of Versailles and having them go through these uh, hugely time-consuming rituals of it waiting on the king uh, from morning till night uh, and engaging in various kinds of gossip and intrigue. Instead of having their local power base, they would be centered at the king's court. And there were many Versailles uh, being formed in Europe at, ver at this time. Uh, not just in France, but in the various courts of the small states of, of what now is Germany. Uh, and in Denmark, for goodness sake, uh, there was this kind of trend towards abs the kings of Spain were attempting uh, to rule by more absolutist thing and get rid of medieval courts and medieval legislatures and things like this. Uh, in England, uh, that the trend, uh, England resisted this trend, and I think this first revolution uh, was a very important uh, uh, turning point in rejecting that trend, which seemed to be prevailing in most of Europe. Um, and it, it, those events were uh, precipitated, as I said, by James becoming a Catholic. Uh, there was a move later in the 1670s to exclude him from the throne, to pass an exclusion act that would uh, not allow a Catholic to succeed to the throne. Uh, and this actually passed the House of Commons on at least one occasion. It prompted three elections for the House of Commons between 1679 and 1681. There hadn't been a general election for the House of Commons since 1661, just after the restoration of the king. So there was a pause of 18 years. Then they had three elections of three years. And there springs into existence something that really looks like a two-party politics. That's what Rob Coons was referring to. And uh, I uh, quote some of the uh, uh, refer, make reference to some of the electioneering thing. Uh, we get the emergence of the Tories and the Whigs in this period. The Tories are those who back the King, the Church of England, and who say that Parliament should not exclude James from the throne. The divine right of kings, he has got the hereditary succession, he should go ahead. Uh, the Whigs are saying that this violates 
our ancient traditions. To have a Catholic king is a violation of our liberties. Uh, we need to pass the Exclusion Act uh, and, um, and so forth. Both names, by the way, were insults. The Tories were, I think, Scottish sheep stealers, and the Whigs were Irish uh, cattle thieves, uh, <laughs> or something of that nature. Uh, so we didn't have, you know, an uplifting politics of consensus, <laughs> uh, even in 1679 to 1681. Uh, it was a very vigorous politics, and you have these wonderful scenes. The History of Parliament Trust has this um, multi-volume series in which they give a description of each county and borough that elected uh, members of the House of Commons and the biographies of each member of the House of Commons. So they would have these elections and uh, the election was called by the sheriff of the county and sometimes in Buckinghamshire he switched, the sheriff switched the election from a Whig town to a Tory town and the Whig people were very unhappy so they rode their horses over the hills at midnight but they wouldn't stay in the Tory town because they didn't want to give the Tory innkeeper the rent. And they slept outside in the fields and then they mass marched into the town square uh, to vote and of course you voted in public and there were contests as to who was allowed to vote uh, and there were various lords riding around on horses and, uh, and that sort of thing. Uh, in the city of Westminster, uh, what is now central London, they, they, they had an electorate of 15,000 people that took several days to vote uh, and there were all these manifestations. Uh, um, the, uh, you had uh, disqualifying uh, various people. Well, then when the House of Commons actually met, there would typically be challenges to the elections of different members. And it would often happen that a majority in the House of Commons would decide that the minority people who had purportedly been elected actually hadn't been. Uh, and they would be thrown out. So the Florida controversy was not something new uh, in the Anglo-American world. Uh, you had this kind of politics. And it rises up in this, uh, in this crucible in England um, where you had a society that, uh, in which such things were possible because of traditions of rule of law, of common law, of local government, of uh, traditions that, that people should be able to speak freely, uh, that you had a right to property and so forth. Um, this was, um, this was uh, something that, uh, that, that pushed forward. The controversy was ended uh, when King Charles II, this wasn't a perfectly democratic system, when King Charles II uh, summoned the Parliament, he, uh, in 1681, he decided that he called it for, he said they, they would have to go to Oxford, not meet in London. He was afraid of the London crowds. Uh, he was against the exclusion bill. And um, he, uh, uh, the different, the, the Tories met in Christ Church and the, um, um, the, the uh, where was it, one of the colleges on the north side of the high street is where the, the Whigs met. They brought revolvers with them and armed things and then suddenly the king came into the chambers at Christ Church where they had, uh, were meeting, the House of Commons was meeting in his royal robes which nobody knew he had brought to Oxford with him which he had to wear to dissolve the parliament uh, and declared and he ruled the rest of his life the next four years without parliament. Uh, so uh, this was still a system in which uh, there was a uh, great dispute about who should be king. Now, Charles, when Charles died in 1685, James did succeed peacefully to the throne. Um, he called a, for the elections of a parliament, which was run, uh, which the Tory side, the side that believed in the right of the king to rule and believed in the Church of England, uh, should, and, and against dissenting Protestantism, uh, should uh, prevail, they prevailed. Uh, there was a rebellion by Charles's oldest illegitimate son, the Duke of Monmouth, um, who was, uh, he was, that rebellion was beaten in the West Country uh, with the help of a soldier whom James had promoted through the ranks, uh, a soldier named John Churchill, who was later the Duke of Marlborough, an ancestor of Winston Churchill and who plays an important role uh, in this series of events. Um, he came, to, it, James, uh, uh, John Churchill came to the uh, attention of James Duke of York because uh, the Duke was having an affair with his uh, older sister Arabella and in fact had four children with her. But anyway, um, the court of King Charles II was not, uh, anyway, it resembled the Clinton administration more than the Bush administration. <laughs> I'll just put it that way. The, uh, um, but James managed to antagonize uh, the parliament. Um, the Parliament wanted to support the King, but they also wanted to support the, the Church of England. 
and James insisted on promoting Catholics to positions, officerships in the army as local officials, uh, eventually as the head of Maudlin College at Oxford University. Uh, he arrested seven bishops of the Church of England when they refused to carry out his order to suppress criticism of, Catholicism, of Catholics by local ministers. Uh, and uh, he, uh, he, he dissolved, he, actually he, he prorogued the parliament, meant that he temporarily adjourned them and then dissolved them in early 1686 and ruled without a parliament. And he spent a lot of time and effort uh, trying to procure the election of a parliament that would approve his power to suspend the Test Act, to hire Catholics, to put them higher up in government and administration. And of course, this aroused fears that he was trying to convert the population uh, or to, uh, and that he was trying to uh, do what Louis XIV was doing uh, in, in France, which is dispensing with old forms of government, with old liberties, with old, with old uh, parliamentary institutions and courts, and substitute for that the absolute rule of the king. Things came to a head in June 1688 when James's uh, second Catholic wife, Mary of Modena, uh, gave birth to a son. Uh, he had been married previously to a Protestant, and he had two Protestant daughters from that first marriage. Uh, Mary, who was married to her cousin William of Orange, Stadtholder of the Netherlands, uh, and Princess Anne, who was guided in her views largely by uh, her childhood friend and, uh, and really chief lady in waiting, uh, Sarah Churchill, John Churchill's wife. Um, and she is, Sarah Churchill is a, uh, is really a wonderfully vivid figure, and one is tempted to write a book just about her. She was, uh, she and John Churchill were apparently uh, crazily in love with each other which of course was not always the case in marriages of this sort. They were both from very modest uh, uh, gentlemen backgrounds, but not much more than that. Uh, they both made their way up through the court in large part by the favor of, of James, Duke of York, and by Princess Anne, who was later Queen Anne. Uh, Sarah Churchill uh, was an important person with Queen, Queen Anne, as she later was, was her chief guides, and then they had a huge feud. And Sarah Churchill later, after the Duke died, was one of the richest women in the kingdom. She was an early investor in the South Sea bubble. She sold out at the top, <laughs> got 100,000 pounds, took away with that. Um, she managed to marry her granddaughters, all to some of the richest men in England, although she was not on speaking terms with any of her daughters. Um, and uh, uh, in the meantime, John Churchill, of course, became the great general of the first decade of the 18th century and one of the greatest uh, generals of all time. Uh, but then they were uh, less important in the reign of James II. But Mary and Anne were uh, heirs to the throne. And part of the, uh, the fears that many people had that James would impose a Catholic uh, monarch, a Catholic absolutism in England, were allayed by the fact that he was an old man. He was 53 years old at this time. Um, his brother had died at 54. Uh, and uh, that he would be succeeded by a Protestant pretty soon and that there wouldn't be that much of a problem. Suddenly the birth of a son makes something different because until a recent decision by Queen Elizabeth II, the son takes precedence over the daughters even if they're older. Uh, the Queen has changed that, although it's a moot point at this point in the succession of the royal family and probably will be for the next hundred years. But uh, in any case, uh, the, uh, uh, and the fear was that uh, that this uh, son uh, would be raised as a Catholic, that he might very well become king while still a minor and his Catholic mother might become the regent, that he would live a long time, and in fact he lived 78 years and died in 1766. Uh, if he had been king, he would have been king longer than Queen Victoria was queen. Uh, and uh, this was, uh, so there, were, there was a movement uh, in England among some of the English lords, the Whigs and others, and including some of the Tories that disliked the way that James was imposing the Catholic Church, um, who were trying to uh, push James aside to somehow uh, make him do something else. And there were rumors at this time that the child was not actually the queen's child, that the baby was smuggled into the room by a warming pan. Uh, there were no Catholic, the only Catholics were the witnesses to the birth. There were always witnesses to royal births uh, to show that they were genuine. Um, the, uh, but uh, Princess Anne, for example, said that she did not believe that the child was real. She thought the pregnancy was false and, uh, and didn't believe in it. Of course, she had some interest in so holding uh, because if it had been real she never, and been accepted, she never would have been queen. But 
in any case. The person, uh, but the person who really took action at this time uh, was not an Englishman. Uh, if you read some of the English narrative histories, they really concentrate entirely on the English and who was uh, upset about this and what they were doing, uh, and that those things are important. Uh, but the real mover uh, was William of Orange. Uh, and one of the things I found in writing this book was that uh, uh, developed an immense admiration for William of Orange and a man who has been, I think, overlooked by history. He is still revered in Northern Ireland by the Protestants of Northern Ireland. And I attended the Orange Ardor mar marches in uh, July 12th, uh, 2003, when uh, great large crowds of people go marching up the streets with antique looking pictures of King Billy. Um, these are, uh, the marches are attended by some considerable consumption of what Rush Limbaugh calls adult beverages. Uh, and uh, our, the, the, it was a peaceful affair, but of course it hasn't been a peaceful affair. But aside from that, William of Orange is basically not remembered, and yet he really was uh, an extraordinary man and a man who I think played uh, an important and essential role in a series of events that, as it turned out, uh, helped to produce uh, the kind of polity, the kind of society, the kind of nation that we live in. Uh, William, the Orange, William of Orange was the son of James II's sister, the sister of Charles II and James II. Uh, his father died before he was born uh, in 1650. Um, he was uh, plagued by various things. His, his, uh, his father died of smallpox in his 20s. Her, his mother and his wife both died of smallpox in their 30s. Uh, he had smallpox himself in his, uh, in his 20s but survived. I mean, this was one of the vagaries of royal existence and the fate of countries could depend on whether a monarch got smallpox at an early age or lived another 50 years uh, and remained in power. Um, but he was, uh, his father had been stadtholder of the Netherlands, of the United Provinces of, uh, of the Netherlands, the Dutch Republic as we refer to it. Uh, and this was a curious and interesting state that had grown up, had fought for its independence from the Spanish Empire virtually, uh, more or less nonstop, at least juridically, from 1584 until 1648. Uh, it would, most of the residents were Protestants, but there were also Catholics. It was made up of seven states plus also some other territory. It had a federal constitution with the states general and then provincial states at each level who were elected by people from towns in which property holding was some. I'm trying to give you the impression that it was a complicated system, even in a small country of two million people. It was a republic of sorts, but it also had uh, this family, the House of Orange, who were the who had been this position of stadtholder was more or less commander in chief of the army, admiral chief of the navy, uh, and sort of executive of the government to the extent that they had an administrative branch of government. Um, and the Orange family were rich. William of Orange, as the single heir of his father, was the richest man in the Netherlands. He owned vast properties in what is now Germany, in the Netherlands, what is now Belgium, and in France, although Louis XIV kept confiscating the French properties, much to his irritation. Um, the, uh, he was rich enough so that he could maintain a peacetime army out of his personal income, uh, which gave him a certain amount of political power. Uh, but he was also, he was, uh, uh, and the Netherlands at this time was the richest state of Europe. The traders from the Netherlands who had started off in the uh, 15th, uh, 14th, 15th century as uh, traders of herring, uh, that was their great commodity. And if you go to the Queen's birthday at the Dutch Embassy in Washington, which I've done, they eat, uh, they, they serve you the raw herring. You're supposed to eat them like, hold them up and eat them like this. It's really kind of disgusting, I have to say, for those of us who are not raised in the Netherlands, although Dutch people love them. Uh, the herring is the basis of their fortune originally. But by the late 17th century, they've got ships sailing all over the world, the Dutch East Indies. They had been in North America, though they lost New York. They had rich colonies in the Caribbean. They had much of Brazil for a while, uh, which was a great sugar colony, uh, sailing all over Africa. Um, they were also hugely creative people. I mean, this is the era of Rembrandt and Vermeer and Franz Hals and all these wonderful painters uh, that we see. Um, this was the Amsterdam of his day, and Amsterdam was the finance center of the world. The Bank of Amsterdam had been established in the, about 1607. Uh, so this was the finance capital of the world. It was also the printing press capital of the world. 
Uh, they had more printing presses and unregulated, unlike most countries in Europe, printing presses that were not regulated and controlled by the government. Uh, and they could print things in uh, something like 12 different languages, Dutch, German, French, of course, uh, Latin, uh, Hebrew, Armenian, uh, all sorts of things. Uh, and so this was a tremendously creative uh, thing. It was also militarily vulnerable, sitting there on that flat land, uh, sometimes flooded, much of it underwater, um, and, uh, and, and at the, with only 2 million people to France's 20 million people to something like 18 million in the various states that uh, occupy what is now Germany, uh, it was also vulnerable. And uh, uh, William of Orange uh, was raised, he hoped uh, to become stadtholder. His mother, who had no political sense at all, suggested that he be appointed stadtholder as an infant. Uh, the idea of having an infant commander-in-chief did not appeal to the Dutch. Uh, the practical Dutch of whatever party. Um, the, uh, but he was raised as a, as a man of letters, but also as a soldier. Uh, he was raised in large part by his political enemies, the Amsterdam merchants by and large. They tended to favor, and I'm probably oversimplifying this somewhat, they tended to favor a policy of appeasement. Make nice with France of Louis XIV, and they won't attack us, and we'll make money, and everything will be fine. Uh, that was basically uh, their policy. Uh, and they had some very uh, competent people. Uh, and so uh, they deliberately refused to, they actually passed a law saying William could never be appointed stadtholder when he was 18 or 19 years old. Um, then in 1672, Louis XIV's armies attacked the Netherlands. They come in through the German states from the east. They overrun five of the seven provinces. Uh, and at this point, the, uh, the Dutch are very discontent with the government they've had. Uh, the grand pensionary of Holland, uh, Jan de Witt, and his brother were torn limb from limb by the mob in The Hague uh, in front of the Binnenhof Palace, which you can, it's a place you can still visit, which I have visited, uh, which looks very peaceful today. And the Dutch look very, you know, kind of calm and everything, but they could get pretty tough uh, when the time came. And they appointed William of Orange the stadtholder of the Netherlands, the commander of the army. He ordered that the dikes be open, that the fields be flooded to keep the French armies from advancing into Amsterdam and the Hague, into the coastal provinces of the Netherlands, into the trading territories. And he was successful. And it was a close-run thing. When the winter came, uh, the, the, the flooded fields started to freeze. There was a danger that the French could come over the ice. Fortunately, they did not. Uh, in that war, uh, on France's side was, was England, King Charles II, whose envoy came over to the Netherlands and said to William of Orange, um, don't, you, don't you see your country is lost? He said, uh, we'll arrange it so you'll become a prince of this little small part of the Netherlands and we'll get rid of the republic and so forth, and your country is lost. Uh, don't you see that? And he said, I will never see my country lost, for I will die in the last ditch. And uh, he succeeded. He waited it out, basically. Uh, Louis XIV got tired of besieging the Netherlands. There were other arrangements. Charles II got out of the alliance. Um, these things went on. Uh, but he saved uh, the Netherlands from uh, conquest. And uh, the great cause of his life uh, after that was to fight the power of Louis XIV, fight the power of this expansionist and, in his view, tyrannical power uh, that was threatening his country and threatening um, the Protestantism and the freedoms, the comparative freedom and toleration that existed in the Netherlands, uh, which was being threatened in his view uh, by this tyrannical power. Now William assumed his wife would in time inherit the English throne, uh, and I think he assumed that he could enlist England uh, in his coalitions against Louis XIV. If you look back at English history from the mid-1400s until the late 1600s, England mainly stayed away from uh, continental wars from uh, fights between, you know, occasionally they would be threatened by France and Spain. Mostly they just steered clear of the continental wars. There were wars between England and Scotland. There were attempts to subdue Ireland. Uh, they concentrated on that rather than on continental wars, and they just let Europe do what Europe was going to do uh, without getting involved in it. Um, William wanted to reverse that policy, uh, and that was his major uh, intention in life, I think. Uh, the birth of this infant prince, of course, threatened to shatter these plans. 
if he should inherit the throne, his wife would presumably never be queen. He would never exert the power of the throne. Uh, his wife, who this was initially, of course, an arranged match uh, that he made with a view towards getting political power himself. He was, uh, apparently he was not a good looking man. He was hunchbacked, had a cough, and was six inches shorter than his wife. And when she, at age 14, was introduced to him as her future husband, she cried for a day. Uh, and, uh, but she became very devoted to him and basically subcontracted all political decision making to him. He had her vote in his pocket at all times uh, and was widely assumed to be so. Uh, so William, even before this birth of the infant prince, William had remained secretly in touch with many of the leading uh, English politicians. He made occasional trips to England. He, he supported James II against the Monmouth Rebellion. Uh, sent, sent over troops, in fact, to help out, um, did, uh, tried to refrain from taking positions on uh, the Exclusion Act and other controversies in English politics. Uh, but he, he had a secret network of people that were keeping in touch. Um, and what he did after the birth of the uh, prince in June 1688, uh, he solicited an invitation uh, to bring an army to England. Uh, purportedly with a view to uh, secure the election of a free parliament, that is one on, not influenced by the king, not under the control of the king. Uh, and he got seven lords, some of them pretty important people, some of them not, uh, to sign it. Uh, as I say, some of the English historians write this up as the, uh, the lords took the initiative and uh, sort of prompted William of Orange to get on with it. My view is that William of Orange clearly had this project in view and uh, was looking for some signatures uh, on a letter he had presumably already more or less drafted. Um, and over the summer of 1688, uh, William secretly assembled an army of 25,000 men, a navy of 500 ships. Uh, he paid small German states uh, to send troops to guard the Netherlands when these soldiers would, when these, when these soldiers would embark on these ships. Uh, although he did not know Louis XIV was, in, was invading somewhere north, he had to wait till late September to find out that Louis XIV was invading the Upper Rhine and not uh, the Netherlands. Um, only then did he fully commit to the invasion. Um, he caused to be printed uh, 50,000 copies of a pamphlet explaining his reasons for coming to England to secure the election of a free parliament. Uh, 50,000 copies were smuggled in. That's pretty high circulation in a country of five million people. And, and these were circulated in this new um, development that they had in London called coffee houses. Uh, coffee houses had just gotten their starts in the 1650s and 60s. By uh, the 1680s, there are several hundred of them. Uh, various pamphlets and things are circulated. Uh, in the, during the exclusion crisis, uh, the Law, the Licensing Act of 1662, which was supposed to give the government control of printing things, uh, was allowed to lapse by Parliament. Uh, sometimes the legislature not acting is a good thing. And uh, this, uh, so you got more free circulation of, of pamphlets and materials. The uh, King James's government, when it you know, got hold of these pamphlets and stuff, decided that, they, first of all, their impulse was to try to suppress them, but then they figured they couldn't do that, so they uh, printed their own answer and reply. Uh, and sent it out. So you had, uh, this was the new media of the day. I mean, today we have talk radio, the blogosphere, uh, Fox News Channel. Then they had the pamphlets smuggled in uh, and circulated throughout England uh, to, to mass effect um, and, and through the coffee houses. So this is, today we have bloggers at Starbucks, then they had pamphleteers in the coffee houses. Um, this was, uh, and then the ships finally set out in October. The first time they set out, uh, there was a bad storm. They had to throw the horses overboard, uh, sailed back to port. Uh, they had to wait, I think, 13 days for a favorable wind, the Protestant wind, the English called it, to sail. Uh, in time it came, and uh, he evaded the English fleet, landed in southwest England about November the 5th. Um, William's army, in the southwest England in, in near Torbay, I don't know, has anybody been to Torbay? It's, uh, if you watch election night broadcast in England, it's the far southwest of England, and there's actually palm trees there. And when they, the, the, the Torbay borough reports its result, they've got a little municipal symbol with palm trees on it. Uh, they're very proud of their palms. Uh, but in any case, this, uh, 
and it's kind of hilly country. They, uh, James, William's army marched rather slowly toward London. He did get some support, but not nearly as much as the uh, English had predicted. His English kind of co-conspirators had said, well, you don't need to bring a brig army because we'll supply lots of people that'll be on your side. He said, no, I think I'll bring 25,000 troops of my own Dutch troops with me. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, that proved to be uh, successful. Uh, James set out for the west from London with an army with uh, John Churchill as second in command. Uh, then at Salisbury in camp, James was afflicted with terrible nosebleeds. He was dithered about whether going on farther. He seemed to lose his nerve. Churchill, one night after dining with the king, rode out with one of uh, Charles II's illegitimate sons, the Duke of Grafton, uh, and joined William's army. Uh, he had engineered a kind of conspiracy uh, in the army of people to desert James in the Protestant cause and to go over to William. Uh, we don't really know all about the conspiracy. Uh, there were not a lot of instant messages sent out that he was unable to recover and perhaps some of the communications were never discovered. Uh, one of the reasons the uh, English fleet, by the way, did not pursue the Dutch fleet down the channel is that some key ships were uh, captained by John Churchill's brother, George Churchill, who said they had to put into port and they didn't have enough provisions and they couldn't get out there and so forth. So this was, there was a Navy part of the conspiracy as well. Um, the, and, uh, you know, this was tremendous. Uh, uh, John Churchill actually explains, sends a letter to the king explaining that his, the Protestant cause was more important to him than his loyalty to the king who had been his patron. It's sort of a nervy letter, it seems to me. And he can't imagine that the king would have been happy to read it, uh, I think. Uh, in London, Sarah Churchill uh, uh, leads Princess Anne down a secret staircase in Whitehall Palace that she'd had constructed. They walk through the mud of Trafalgar Square where Anne loses one of her shoes in the mud. They met a waiting coach and sped to the north of England where the Earl of Danby had assembled forces loyal to William. So this was uh, a kind of conspiracy that went very uh, close to James's household and his family. Uh, and the desertion of Churchill and Anne seems to have broken James' nerves. Uh, he decided to send the queen and the infant uh, child uh, to France and to escape there himself. He failed on his first attempt when he threw the great seal of England into the Thames. Uh, he succeeded ultimately on the second. Uh, some guy stopped, some fisherman stopped him, the king, and detained him. And then William gave or the, the king wanted to come back to London. And then James said, no, um, you should go somewhere else. And uh, he said, well, he wanted to go to Rochester, which is down the Thames, farther towards the sea. And James said, uh, William said, fine. And he ordered that the troops not guard him from leaving. So that if James wanted to leave the country, uh, he could do so. William did not, you know, understood that the English did not want to see another king executed or die in battle, uh, as King Charles I had been executed in 1649. Um, so uh, William marched forward and occupied London with his 25,000 blue-coated Dutch troops. Uh, the, the Londoners uh, went to the uh, what is now Hyde Park and had sticks with oranges on the top of them for a William of Orange to proclaim him. William, who didn't like ceremony very much, took a shortcut to St. James's Palace and avoided most of them. Um, William was in a position where he might have declared himself king. Uh, he was the military master of England. The king had disappeared uh, and the purported heir to the throne. Um, but I, he seemed to understand uh, that uh, uh, the English would just, that that would not work, that the English would not accept it, that the kind of society they were and the kind of traditions that they had uh, would not make that effective. Uh, he understood that they did not want to see another king executed. Uh, and so he called for the election of a new parliament and uh, during the elections in 16, January 1689 conspicuously refrained from influencing the election. The new House of Commons was split between Tories and Whigs the House of Lords had more Tories. Uh, they met in February. And they had a series of discussions about whether the king had abdicated the throne or whether the throne was vacant. Uh, one of the lawyers said, uh, you know, we have found the throne vacant. We did not make it so. Uh, and we have to do something. The Marquis of Halifax, who's an interesting character, uh, uh, who was always kind of a compromiser, he wrote a book called The Character uh, 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 of a Trimmer. Um, said of, uh, of William, uh, uh, just 
as we did not know what to do with him, we did not know what to do without him. And in a secret conversation, apparently with Halifax, we're not sure, and with a couple other lords, William basically said in February, uh, if you don't make me king, and I don't want just my wife to be queen, I'm not going to be held by apron strings, if you don't make me king, I will go back to the Netherlands and let you solve your own affairs. Uh, and so the parliament votes to declare William king and Mary queen. Uh, they are crowned in the banqueting hall in Whitehall, a building you could, uh, most of Whitehall Palace burned in 1698, but the banqueting hall by the Italian influence architect Inigo Jones is still there. Uh, Charles II was executed from its balcony. There's a, uh, uh, the ceiling is painted by Rubens uh, at Charles I's behest uh, earlier in his reign, obviously. Um, it's, it's, it's a nice tourist thing to do if you're going to London to take a look at the banqueting hall. Um, and uh, Parliament also did something else, though, uh, that proved to be permanently important. It passed a Declaration of Right, declaring that subjects had certain guaranteed rights that could not be violated by the monarch. Um, some of them were really recitations of uh, things that James had tried to do and which they considered illegitimate. They were sort of uh, uh, specific grievances that they had. Uh, but they also had, uh, they included provisions that were the predecessors or inspiration of Americans' right to trial by jury, uh, indictment by grand jury, right against self-incrimination, right to keep and bear arms. Uh, this was a giant step forward for guaranteed rights and one that was uh, never really reversed. Um, it, was, uh, it has been taken and was taken by America's founders as uh, uh, a vindication or a production of the uh, philosopher and writer John Locke, uh, although probably it wasn't. The, the founders thought it was Locke's work. Locke actually had been in the Netherlands during much of this period, and his two treatises on government were not published, and then only anonymously, until later in 1689. Um, and they were really meant to justify a revolution against Charles II at the time of the exclusion crisis. Um, but they're also an assertion that we have rights of liberty uh, and property uh, that should not be violated by government. And in effect, uh, that was the Declaration of Right in some rather different way and with more specificity was saying something like the same thing. Uh, they also called for regular sessions of Parliament, rather vague terms. As I mentioned, Charles II and James II had ruled, ruled for long periods without one. If they had enough revenue from existing laws, they didn't bother to call Parliament. What did they need Parliament for? Uh, Louis XIV, of course, and his father had not had a meeting of the States General since 1614. Uh, and there was not to be another one until 1789. Um, but as a practical matter, um, the, the, the Declaration of Right was rather unspecific about how often Parliament should meet, but as a practical matter, it had to meet every year. And the reason was that Parliament's decision to name William King meant that England was now at war with Louis XIV. Uh, accepting William as king, proclaiming him king, meant that they were at war with France, which was, a, uh, as I've said, a terribly militarily uh, very strong and expansionist power. The current taxes were clearly not enough to pay for what became a world war, which was fought not just in Europe, but North America and India as well. So Parliament voted the taxes grudgingly and temporarily. Uh, it passed something called the Mutiny Act um, for a term of one year. The Mutiny Act um, protected officers of the military against civil suits by their subordinates. Uh, without that, they could be sued for disciplining their troops. Uh, but it lapsed after a year. So if you wanted to have a military, uh, you needed to renew the Mutiny Act. Actually, they sort of fudged about it just the way Congress does now about the continuing resolution and things about renewing it. Uh, but that was part of the power. In effect, that meant that Parliament had to meet every year, and it has met every year since 1689 uh, to this day. Um, and this was uh, a giant step forward, I think, for representative government just at a time when so much of Europe was going in the opposite direction. Uh, but even new taxes were not enough to pay for the World War. There were other proposals that were advanced, some adopted, lotteries and tontines. You know, people know what a tontine is, something you invest in and the last person to live gets all the money. Uh, there was actually a proposal for a levy of 100,000 pounds on the Jewish community of London. Uh, this was rejected even before anybody talked about a Jewish lobby. Uh, and in 1694, they borrowed an idea for the Dutch and created the funded national debt in the Bank of England. 
Uh, and in time, this provided not only financing for the government for war, uh, at bargain rates. The English government, the British government borrowed uh, between this time and the Napoleonic Wars more than a century later, typically borrowed at 3% interest. Louis XIV had to pay his tax farmers 50% of the taxes. So this was a hugely, a hugely efficient way of raising money for war. But it also created a freely circulating currency, a dependable form of investment. You could buy consoles that consolidated debts of uh, the national debt and you were just absolutely sure you were going to be paid. It's like the Treasury bill today, an absolutely safe investment and therefore a form of storing up capital uh, and a source of financing for new business enterprises, which in the next century would create British Industrial Revolution. So this was really a giant step forward for global capitalism. Amsterdam had been the great financial center of the world of the Western world. Now London became the great financial center of the Western world, and it is still one of the great financial centers of the Western world, uh, as is New York. Um, William uh, was a military man all his life. Uh, he led his troops in Ireland to the Battle of the Boyne against James. Uh, a bullet grazed his collar. He says it, it were well, it came no closer. Uh, he was. Uh, um, he fought in the Netherlands. He was actually away from England during most of the first half of the 1690s. He was not always a successful general, but he kept fighting and ultimately had enough success to conclude a satisfactory treaty with Louis XIV in 1697. Um, he was, uh, uh, but what he did that was most important, I think, is establish the principle, which was followed by England and Britain in most of the centuries since, most of the time since, and by the United States for most of the last century of opposing tyrannical expansionist powers that threatened to take over Europe and the world, to, uh, to insist on a balance of power uh, in Europe, as uh, Pitt the Younger and Castlereagh uh, said a century later. Um, this is something that England, a task, a responsibility, that England and Britain uh, had never taken on before 1689. They have taken it on uh, most of the times uh, most of the time ever since, with hugely important consequences for the history of the world. Now, it wasn't inevitable that these steps forward would not be reversed. Uh, you can do a lot of counterfactuals in history from 1689 to the present day uh, and have things go the other way. Uh, but as it happened, uh, these, uh, these steps forward were not reversed, or at least not completely. Uh, and we live with the reverberations of this first revolution today. Uh, Britain evolved towards a parliamentary democracy, and the North American colonists who rebelled against the British in 1776 did not do so because they rejected the results of this revolution, but because they believed they were being denied the rights they had gained and been from it, that had been granted and declared to them. Uh, when they set up their new republic, they duplicated or expanded some of the features of the revolution of 1688-89. Their articles of confederation and their constitution established a representative government, multiple legislatures. Their declaration of independence and bill of rights set out guaranteed rights. Their first secretary of the treasury and the first congress established a funded national debt and a bank of the United States. And Alexander Hamilton was asking, absolutely in conscious imitation of what had happened in, in England uh, almost a hundred years before uh, and with the intention of, of give, making the United States the same kind of financial and commercial power uh, that England had become and of course that did come to pass. Uh, and in the 20th century, the United States has joined Britain in fighting and defeating tyrannical hegemonic powers that threatened to take over Europe and the world. Imperial Germany in World War II, Nazi Germany and Imperial Japan uh, World War I, uh, Nazi uh, Germany, Imperial Japan, and World War II, the Communist Soviet Union in the Cold War, and now forces of Islamist terrorism, uh, terrorists in their fight against uh, civilization. The Anglosphere, as uh, the author James Bennett puts it, um, Britain, the United States, Canada, at least in the World Wars, Australia, uh, uh, New Zealand on occasion, uh, and now, in some respects, India, where the elite is all English speaking and where they have a rule of law and representative government modeled on the English system, uh, have been leaders uh, in these movements ever since. Uh, for me, it's not possible to imagine that this would have happened in the same way if James II and his son had had undisturbed reigns 
uh, and had been able to consolidate power, at least to some extent, the way that Louis XIV had in France. Uh, and by the way, uh, one of uh, James II's uh, policies, uh, he was very interested in the North American colonies. Um, he was governor of the Hudson Bay Colony at one point and then gave that position to John Churchill. Uh, he abolished the, the colonial legislatures in, uh, in the New England colonies, in New York, in New Jersey, uh, and he may have been preparing to abolish the colonial legislatures uh, in the colonies uh, to the south uh, and to exert direct royal rule on them. Uh, the British historian J.H. Eliot in his recent book comparing the British and Spanish colonial histories of North America makes the point that one of the handicaps the Spanish colonies had when it came time to assert their independence and then to build workable governments is that they did not have colonial legislatures. They did not have colonial assemblies. They did not have the practice in self-rule, in self-government, in elective democracy, in rule of law uh, that the North American colonies had. But the North American colonies might not have had that if James II and his heirs had stayed in power. They were dismantling that legacy. It's the legislatures of the North American colonies which were important, played important roles uh, for some of, uh, many of the founders, of course, had their initial experiences in those legislatures or in connection with them. And as for the world conflict, um, at the moment of maximum danger in the summer of 1940, spring of 1941, when Nazi Germany was allied with Soviet Russia, Imperial Japan, and they were threatening to engulf the landmass of Eurasia. Uh, Britain and the United States had the good fortune to be led by Winston Churchill, the direct descendant of John Churchill, Duke of Marlborough, and Franklin Roosevelt, descendant of the Dutch patroons who were countrymen of, William of Orange, King William III. Uh, together, they staunched the flow of evil and prevented the forces of darkness from opposing on earth regimes resembling those of George Orwell's 1984. Uh, to all these people, I think we owe thanks for granting us the blessings of guaranteed liberties, representative governments, global capitalism, and the determination to prevent tyrants from ruling the earth. Uh, and I think we should remember among their ranks um, the, uh, the man who more than any other was responsible for our first revolution, uh, William of Orange, uh, King William III. It's really impossible to imagine the world in the America we inhabit today, if this exceedingly difficult enterprise, this very unlikely series of events, I mean, the in-trade odds would have been heavily against it, had not happened, had not been made to happen by this extraordinary man and these other extraordinary men, men and women that were involved in it. Thank you very much. And uh, Ron, if I could ask you to um, repeat the question or the gist of it, so, so that we can get into the mic. For the sake of the video. Okay, for the That's sake of the right. video, yeah. let's, sir. We'll try this young woman here. Thank you for a very interesting talk. You've been stressing um, very much how the trend of the time was toward absolutism. All these things might not have happened, and I wonder if you'd like to say more about why Europe was moving to form the Earth absolutism. Why were they were moving towards absolutism? Okay, uh, you've asked me to expand from one country to 20 countries. Uh, the, uh, well, I think it was, I, it was seen to be more efficient. There was also clearly, a, you know, there had been terrible religious wars. I mean, the Thirty Years' War, you know, cut the po population of Germany by 30 percent. The English Civil War of the 1640s actually had more demographic impact than World War I had on Britain. You know, in World War I, you know, remember the first day of the Somme, July 1st, 1916, the casualties were 60,000 men that day. You know, yeah, they complained about Iraq. Um, yeah. So, you know, th and the idea was it would bring you peace. I mean, it's Hobbes' Leviathan, isn't it? Um, you know, Hobbes was writing at a time of the English Civil War and said, look, um, we can't depend on, you know, government is not going to be run by the godly. Men are brutes that want, you know, are motivated by fear and, and uh, desire for gain. And so you have to have an absolute ruler set up some kind of religion and rule in that thing. So that's Hobbes. Locke says, hey, you know, we've got uh, rights of life, uh, liberty, and property. We ought to have a government that's run more or less by consent. 
uh, in different ways. And, uh, you know, the England took the lock turn. Many people thought the Hobbes turn, and not just in the 17th century, try the 20th. Uh, you know, these things happen again and again, so it's, uh, perhaps it's, uh, you know, it's giving up uh, safe, it's giving up, uh, you know, for security, give up freedom. That's a bargain many people have been willing to take, or at least not willing to fight against. And um, uh, the English took a different path. Yes, sir. Well, well, the question is about George Saville, the Marquis of Halifax, who was uh, a, a great writer, great letter writer. He invents phrases. The phrase kicked upstairs, Halifax, in a letter to his brother, who was the ambassador in Paris. Um, and uh, he was, uh, the questioner quotes uh, Winston Churchill's biography of his ancestor, the Duke of Marlborough, saying that Marlborough had respect for Halifax, and Halifax had what regard? Yeah, well, regard. Well, John Churchill, his wife seems to have made enemies, and she would pursue. John Churchill seems to have been friends with everybody, to have been immensely handsome, immensely charming, um, and uh, to keep in touch with everybody all the time, including James II when he went over to France, as it turns out. Uh, there's a correspondence that still goes on. Um, and, uh, you know, you, you suspect that Marlborough doesn't tell you everything that he's thinking, even to his wife, at least when they're apart. Um, but he's, you know, he's operating in a time when you make the wrong political bet, you will be executed. I mean, Anthony Ashley Cooper, the first Earl of Shaftesbury, who was the chief organizer of the Whigs in their two-party politics of 1679-81, was indicted uh, for uh, treasonous or thereabouts, uh, or the, 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 the Crown brought an action against him, and the Grand Jury of London came back with a bill of non possumus We cannot find an error. This was in the... Uh, Whigs controlled the uh, board of aldermen that selected the sheriff, that selected the jurymen of London. And in fact, a couple of the jury was clearly rigged. There were a couple of guys who later founded the Bank of England and stuff were on that, that jury. Um, well, the king caused, uh, gave, uh, revoked the charter of the city of London, put in a different charter, which resulted in a Tory board of aldermen, which chose a Tory sheriff to choose. And uh, Shaftesbury left for the Amsterdam, where he died. Uh, and John Locke, his physician and philosopher in residence, went with him um, to Amsterdam and stayed there until 1689 because to bet, bet wrong politically meant that you meant your death. Um, part of your question is, is, is it time for another Halifax biography? I mean, there was a woman named, a British woman named H.C. Foxcroft who wrote an edition of Halifax's letters. I think it was published in 1898, and then she wrote a, bi a partial biography that was published in 1946, which a great, an extended period of contemplation uh, <laughs> over this man uh, over a long period of time. Um, Halifax was not one of the seven signers of the letter to William III. He was a trimmer. He was always kind of cautious. But then when William comes to London, one of the guys he talks to a lot is Halifax. and. Um, and at one point, the king is, uh, has fled back toward London. William, and the king says, well, I, what, he sends a message, say, I want to have a meeting uh, with you, William, you know, on neutral ground. And William says, nothing doing. Um, he says, I'm, I'm going to send him a letter uh, saying, absolutely not, and you must leave London. And by the way, you Halifax are going to deliver it at 1 a.m. in the morning to the king. And, uh, and does so. So they used each other. 
but Halifax becomes a force for, he calls for, for making William king on the grounds that they have no practical alternative. They need a king, they're in a war, um, they need to uh, do something, and he is in fact sort of William's chief minister for most of the calendar year 1689, and then he grows weary, there's dissension. The history of William's very ministries is so, so complicated that I can't imagine I could do it as a book that would keep the readers, not only would it not keep the readers interest, but after a while you would really be wanting to draw diagrams and where did this go, what did this guy do on this issue, and then he switched over on that one, and it's, it gets real complicated. Yes, sir. In your introduction, you spoke of our nation as being uh, the most successful in the history of the, of the world, which is an opinion that I share. And uh, to what do you attribute the, uh, all of the negativism that we see in the media today? Well, it's not the, you know, the, the question is, to, what do we, if we're such a successful nation, why are we, uh, why is there so much media criticism? I think it's because we're a successful nation and because the media doesn't run it as much as they'd like to, so they're cross with it. Uh, uh, I mean, that's sort of a nasty little explanation, but as somebody who has been in the media or in close proximity to it in Washington for now 35 years, I don't think it's wholly off the mark. Uh, you know, it could be said, if I could say this in an academic sesh setting, it could be said of academics and, as well and New York intellectuals, including some of my conservative New York intellectual friends that were discontent with a society that doesn't have the good sense to turn itself over to us to run it. Uh, <laughs> and instead, these rich, these vulgar politicians, these rich men that amass various sums of money, some of which, however, we would like for our institution, uh, and these politicians whom we'd like to vote some money for our institution, um, you know, uh, instead these people are ruling us. Can that possibly make sense? Um, yeah, I mean, it's part of the price, you know, if you, if you go to the history, one of the things, I've got a book on my shelf which I've never read called The Napoleonists, which is about Charles James Fox and some of these other people that basically opposed the British government, the governments of Pitt and Castlereagh and so forth and in the Napoleonic Wars and wanted Napoleon to win. Does that sound familiar? Uh, <laughs> You know, uh, go figure. Uh, it, you know, it, it, I mean, George III had a reason for wanting to keep Fox out of government. Uh, and, you know, it, uh, Fox is still a more charming figure to many who follow this period than William Pitt the Younger, who is the prime minister who works tirelessly for the defeat of Napoleon, uh, dies after the Battle of Trafalgar, but also, you know, after naval supremacy is established, the Battle of Trafalgar, but after the Allies had sustained a terrible loss at Austerlitz, in, both in December 1805. He dies the next month, but you know, Pitt, nobody will make a hero of Pitt, uh, who was on belts, I think, defending freedom. And also, hey, by the way, they abolished the slave trade um, and sent the Royal Navy around the world, unilaterally abolishing it on other people. Unilateral policy. This is nothing new. This has been with us uh, for a long time, and I think it's. Uh, you know, to some extent, one of the unavoidable feature, features of a society that is free enough to let people say what they want to, that is rich and prosperous enough to support uh, people like you and me who can read the books we want and write the things we want to do uh, without too much mar regard for market return. Uh, you know, and we don't have to just dig a ditch somewhere, you know, root out stumps out of farmland in order to make a living. Um, so. Yeah, I, I think that explains a lot of it. Um, I don't know, am I being unfair? <laughs> anyway, sir. Sorry, may, I, uh, may I follow up on the question yeah. of Professor Franklin? First of all, many thanks for bringing the 1688 revolution to light, uh, which is quite a feat considering it's cold in Austin and there's a democratic bloodbath right outside. <laughs> <Yeah. clears throat> now, the question, I'm, I'm a Bo Both I'm small d and, li and large d, okay. <laughs> Yeah. Germany and France. And the other 
one a theory that was popular at some point in Europe, the theory of historical synchronism, 1848, 1968, the czars were dictators in various other parts of Europe, etc., etc. How do you reconcile the two? Do you even need to reconcile them, or is there truly another arc for the English-speaking world? Well, is there another? The question is: Is there another arc for the English-speaking world? And you mentioned some of the great dates and what we might call the Anglosphere history and then the other continental things. I think there is, uh, you know, there is more of a divide between the English-speaking world and let us say the continental world than I was aware of when I was, say, an undergraduate in the 1960s. Uh, I think we thought some of those changes were going to erode away and in the period of the Cold War we thought, hey, Western Europe is becoming a lot like America. You know, Germany even has a federal republic and um, you know, which, parts of which they really did copy from the U.S. Constitution. Uh, and um, it would become that way. But, you know, as I look at it now in the longer run of history, you do have some very major differences. Um, uh, rule of law, common law in the, in the Anglosphere, um, civil law, uh, Roman law, uh, code law, uh, and the continent. Now, you know, we have code law in Louisiana, but I rest my case. Uh, the, but it's, you know, those are different traditions with different ramifications that help to shape different kinds of societies and civil law tends to promote more centralization of power in the state, centralization of power in economic entities. You know, I mean, you know, go to France. Who runs France? Well, that's, you know, it's a short book, you know. They're, uh, graduates of the Ecole Nationale you know, d'Administration, some of them are in government, some are there in Paribas BNP, some of them are in Elf Aquitaine, so, you know. Um, you know, you bet they all know each other and so forth. Uh, who runs the United States? It's a longer list. Uh, you know, hugely longer and also changes a lot. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the biggest corporations today versus the biggest corporations in the 1950s, you know, what's the overlap? Not very many. Fascinating. Uh, we have greater capacity for change and adaptation. Uh, you know, some of this, as I say, is happy accident. Uh, and I consider 1688, 89 in many ways a happy accident. What if the Protestant wind hadn't come around? November is not usually the month you'd pick to cross the English Channel with 500 ships. And yet it worked. Uh, you know, some of our Protestant forebears attributed that to an almighty God intervening in human affairs. Well, they, uh, well, it doesn't, dis, you know, the events don't disprove that. I mean, one of the things William III, who didn't have much of a sense, William of Orange, who didn't have much of a sense of humor, believed, he landed on there with, uh, uh, he was a Calvinist who believed in the doctrines of predestination and so forth. And he had brought with him the uh, Church of England clergyman Gilbert Burnett, whom he later made a bishop and who wrote a history of the period. And when they land at Torbay on Guy Fawkes Day, November 5th, 1688, in the English calendar, um, he says to, uh, to Burnett, he says, well, Mr. Burnett, what do you think of predestination now? <laughs> Yeah, well, can you imagine the suspense this man must have had because if this enterprise had gone wrong, it would have been ruinous for him, ruinous for his country. You know, horrible mess. Um, he could have easily paid with his life, his fortune, everything. Um, and yet it worked out against the odds. Uh, you know, he could make a fortune on in-trade. Could have if it was in place then. And people did make a fortune in the Amsterdam mar markets on it, I think, actually, because the stocks went way up after William was successful. <laughs> yes? Uh, one of the things that you mentioned in your book almost in passing that really intrigued me uh, was that in the, in the period when James was actually going to, to meet his, his son, William of Orange, um, you talked about the difficulty uh, that he had specifically with, not, with raising the military uh, uh, life and so on. Yeah, you're actually, you know, you're, you're, you've been reading about the Second Amendment. 
The question is about, did the militia go into misuse? What was the condition of the English army? Uh, in suppressing the Monmouth Rebellion in June, July of 1685, James had specifically raised additional military troops and called them uh, into being from the militia or whatever, and, and he had brought over Catholic officers from Ireland um, to, uh, to assist in this, and he specifically did not want to rely on the militias because he didn't trust them. After all, they were run by local Protestants, and maybe they wouldn't be on his side. And throughout the reign, he wants to have more of a standing army, or at least so his political enemies argue and believe and cite uh, chapter and verse for. And of course, the English had this aversion to standing armies from the Cromwell period, where interestingly, you know, in, in France, it's the royal, the king, the royal side that builds the standing army against the formerly independent nobles or whatever forces of merchants and things there are. In England, it was Cromwell, uh, the Protestant dissenters, who have the standing army against the king and who use it, you know, to great effect, but also to run the government and bully the people, or so they believe. Uh, and they fear that James is going back to that. That's the general fear. And the, he's certainly downplaying the militia. And it's one of the reasons that, you, you know, you get the right to keep and bear arms. As I recall, it's, um, let's see if I got the right, Joyce Milton, who, th there's a woman that's written a book on the uh, Second Amendment, and how it, um, how it changes during this period from the 1660s, you, a male free men, you know, who are not serfs or something, which there weren't many in England, have an obligation to keep and bear arms, to serve in the militia, and then it becomes a right, a right to keep and bear arms, less of an obligation. And the founders in the Militia Act, in the, passing the Second Amendment for the First Congress and the Militia Act, um, have it, you know, sort of go, you know, to that process too, that you have a right to keep and bear arms so that you may be available and ready to serve as a member of a militia that can be called into active duty in case of rebellion, disorder, invasion, uh, or what, whatever other kind of emergency there has been. So that's also a difference from the continental systems. I mean, you know, on the continents, uh, only, uh, you know, gentlemen, royalty, officers can keep and bear arms. The ordinary people cannot. And uh, in the English-speaking world, it was different.